I believe that our artistic view of what we do in making records should not be relegated just to records, but should be relegated to equipment that you build. It's full of vision and full of artistry. It's beautiful. I'm Jack Joseph Quigg, and today I am the moderator for Meet the Maker. What makes anything great that we use in terms of technology is what is honest to the original intent. It's all about honesty. Of, co of course, equipment, in my mind, needs to have a personality. It needs to have a little bit of a character. It needs to have its own, its own perspective, its own character, its own attitude, which allows you to pick different pieces of equipment based on what you want that way. But they still are honest to what you're capturing. You know, with sound, it's all about feeling it, hearing it, touching it. With sound, it should hit all five senses. The modern designer today understands their effect on the record making process. The aesthetic really, really affects you and how you perceive that product. You're thinking out of the box and you're thinking with vision and you're thinking with creativity. Same way we do when we make a record. We think with vision, we think with creativity. We think of what's different. Maybe it pushes me to create in a way that I never even thought of. That's the beauty. We have Shadow Hills, we have Manly, we have Slate, and we have Barefoot. These are the rock stars of today. They make the equipment, they make everything that we use to create the beautiful tapestries we do and to make the beautiful records that we make. Thomas Barefoot. Your speakers, when I first saw them, I didn't even know how to look at them. Like, I didn't know what the hell I were. I wish we had a photo of them. They look like something you've never seen before. And I'd like to know from you, um, what inspired that design? What, why did you even get into making speakers? I, I, I always tell everybody it was, it was sort of naivety because I, I'm pretty new to the, I mean, I'm very new to the recording world. And um, I had, uh, um, really the business got started online in gear sluts and I was just kind of messing around, but I had always built speakers all my life. Uh, and then I learned that, oh, by the way, um, in the recording studio, people are using what I think amounts to just crappy little bookshelf speakers to, <laughs> sorry for anybody who uses bookshelf speakers, but, um, you know, to mix and, and, uh, and to record. And, and then supposedly at the end of the process, uh, they send it off to the mastering engineer who's got the real speakers. And um, that just, that I was indignant. It seemed like a ridiculous thing to me. Shouldn't everybody from the beginning to the end through the whole process be using the same things, hearing the same things, having the same possibilities of, of what they can do? And, uh, and so uh, I just, having built speakers all my life, I thought, well, okay, I'm going to just make this thing because this is something I think should be there, should, something I want. And, uh, you know, to build that speaker, that mastering speaker that fits inside of a control room, that works like a near field, that, that does all these things. And uh, the crazy look of the speakers is really just, uh, just a matter of logistics, you know. It's just where I need a lot of drivers and I, I have to put them somewhere. And uh, so, yeah, you know, you're going to put the subwoofers on the sides because that's literally the only place that they can fit. And then we have, um, on the other side of them, uh, Stephen Slate, who is uh, in my opinion, um, one of the forefront runners of digital technology. Um, a lot of things he's coming up with, not only are they different, but they're flawless. Um, he has a trigger that he makes that I personally use in Pro Tools uh, for replacing drums or you know, adding samples to drums. It cannot be touched. Doesn't fail, never messes up. It's brilliant, it's perfect. His digital compressor, his mastering compressor, one of the first things he made, brilliant, can't, can't be touched. But what's interesting about you that I've discovered about you is you started off as a musician, correct? I did, yeah. And, and so here you are now, you start off as a musician, you love being a musician, and now you're making and producing equipment, correct? 
Right. Um, I mean, to me, the music is really what everything revolves around. You know, we talk so much in this industry about gear and this and knobs and EQs, and, and believe me, I'm, I'm guilty of that as anyone else. But when it comes down to it, the whole point is, is that at the end of the day, you want to sit there with a bunch of people who you hopefully like and listen to this piece of music and look at each other and have that look in your eyes that you are, you know, you, you've made this, this piece of art. And, uh, and, and my passion regarding that art is trying to figure out ways to use modern technology to get to that art uh, quicker, better, faster, more creatively, and, and more affordably. So that's kind of my take on how I try to operate my company. And you're, you're actually making also uh, basically products that replace drummers, correct? Drums. Sure. Um, well, how do you feel would, about would, that? Would, because you're a musician, yeah. right? It's, it's a really good question. Um, so yeah, we make a product that uh, you can program essentially drum parts, and, and that's a, it's an interesting thing, but uh, I look at it like this. There's so many people out there who want to make great music, and they want to have a drum sound that sounds like, you know, they hear in, on major records that, you know, like stuff like you produce. I mean, you know, uh, your Black Crows record, this great big drum sound, I'm sure you'd agree that, that to get that kind of drum sound, you know, you, know, you went to this big studio, recorded with lots of mics and lots of pre's and lots of expense. Now, th my question is why shouldn't someone who, you know, lives somewhere in the Midwest, who has a part-time job, who just loves making music, be able to get that same sound? Why don't they have the right to make the same art? Is it because of cost? So yeah, so I, I think on one end, you know, sure, th this person is, in a sense, replacing a drummer by using my drum software, but they're also getting the chance to make a great piece of art and great piece of music that they're super happy about that they would not have been able to have done had they not had this product. So I think that there's, it's a fair balance where if you have the means to hire a great drummer and a great studio and a great room, great mics, do it. Awesome. I do it all the time. I did it last week. Uh, but if you don't, now you have your option as well. So I'm, I feel strong about that. Ivana Manley, um, so you've been doing this for quite a while, correct? Since 1989. All right. Yeah. And, and so, and you have tremendous tremendous amount of products that you've put out. We've been very guilty of producing many, many products at okay. one so, time. <laughs> I, I have two questions for you. And the first one I want to ask you is, how do you um, stay like excited, innovative, creative when you're putting out so much product all the time? How do you come up with the next cool thing? What makes you, as a creator, think that way? You know, sometimes it's really easy to get lost in all the noise of, uh, you know, customer service for all the existing products or managing vendors or, you know, you were talking about a, a screen getting, you know, sold out from under you when you had already paid for them. You know, problems happen in manufacturing all the time. And in fact, we'd be very bored if, if nothing happened like that. It's a very exciting job, actually, <laughs> if you like solving problems. Um, so, but it's very easy to, as the head of the company, to who wants to take care of everybody all the time, you know, to get lost in all the noise of solving all these problems and helping all these people, and um, you know, for me, I've I've got to consciously take steps back and get out of the noise, in order to um, have the vision to look forward. In fact, I had to hire someone. I had to hire Matt Ward, who used to be the boss at Universal Audio as a consultant to basically beat me in, on the head and say, don't forget to look forward and, and, and ask me a question like, Ivana, what do you want to do in five years? I'm like, I don't know, I'm just so busy fixing everything, now I can't think of it. You know, that's, that's how not to think creatively. So for me, I had to actually pay someone to remind me to look forward and, and get that vision back because it's so easy to get lost in the noise. Out of your fairly expansive line, line of equipment, um, do you have one piece of that you push out that you really have a love affair for? Or special? Uh, all the ones I did. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, I, the first product I did was on my own when I took over the company um, in 1996. The first product I worked on, uh, there were two actually: the Vox Box and a Hi-Fi product called the Stingray. And the the Stingray was really interesting because the uh, the shape of it which looks like a, st a stingray fish you know looking at it from above that came from I uh, I wanted to explore like how to do the stereo little stereo amplifier in a very symmetrical layout and so the the square kind of shape came to that way 
uh, form, the, the artistic shape of it came from, well, what might be best electrically? Okay. Um, and then when it came time to develop the circuitry that would go in this pretty box, uh, the neat thing was developing the, the transformers, the output transformers. So we, we wind those at Manly Labs, and we, we have a whole winding setup. And it's great, to because all the sound from the amplifiers coming through that transformer, and it's got to be the best part of the circuit. So it's a little amplifier, 40 watts, and I wanted it to sound like a bigger amplifier. And um, we, we played with, we started with the existing transformer that we were building, and that had a sound. And then it's like, yeah, but this circuit has never been known for having a lot of bass. And why is that? It's not the tube's fault. Let's pick on this transformer some more. So we, we studied some parameters like, well, if we redo this, uh, yeah, it's only measuring like whatever, 60 Henry's inductance, whatever. Let's run that up to 160 Henry's and see what happens. So then we do that, we measure it. Oh wow, look at that flat bass response, oh it's great. And then we listen to it and we put it on a big knife switch, you know, the old one and the new one. Mm -hmm. And the new one, we knew it measured better, but we're sitting there listening to the two and it's like boring, very boring. So it's like, well, all right, we got it to measure perfect, but it's freaking boring. So let's bring that inductance back <laughs> down a little bit and let it just saturate a little bit earlier in the bass. We're just picking on the bass. And let's just try that and see what it sounds like. And we tried that, and we measured it, and it's like, oh, yeah, that's not so good right there. But all right, let's just listen to it. Listen to it. Now, that's when my foot started tapping. And it's like, how do you measure your foot tapping? How do you measure the goosebumps you get on your arm? So when, and it's very rare to actually do something like that, but when that happens, I'm, I'm really looking for that. I'm looking for stuff that your body responds to that you really can't measure. And that's, that's it's like, right, we're rocking on that one, let's do that. That's, that's great. So, so Peter, you and I were talking earlier about um, one of the downfalls that can happen um, is you can become you know, a gear hound, a, a gear fanatic, a gear freak, and get lost in that. And that's the downside, right? As I said, there's, there's beauty. As we all know, there's beauty, and there's also ugliness in everything, right? There's, there's nothing that we, no subject we could speak of uh, that wouldn't fall underneath the category. Um, have you, what's your feeling about people maybe getting too, you know, deep into equipment? Do you have an opinion about that? Oh, well, sure. I mean, and, you know, I think uh, probably all of us are successful at making excellent gear because we, we love gear. We don't hate the products we make, you know, and we are striving to make the best things because it is a singular obsession uh, that, uh, you know, there's a level of craft and beyond craft there's inspiration, right? That, that's what we aspire to. And as musicians and as performers and engineers and recording artists, you know, that we're all advocates for this, the record, this music, this thing that transcends our own being. And that's the that's the point. That is the end result of the game. But what can happen is, you know, we're not in control of our environment and circumstances, and that if there could be some kind of technological advantage that I could take that could help me to get there, the dark side of that could be that you're waiting for the new software vision to come out before you finish your song. You know, that sounds humorous in this pejorative thing to say, but, it, but I've heard it. And from me, and you probably heard it from you. And so it's, it's something that we have to be careful of, that the technician destroys the artist. That it's wonderful to have things that are inspiring, to use things that, you know, you, you, you pl play an instrument, you play an old Mellotron through the Leslie, and it's like, oh my goodness, and you write a new song. Um, there are things that make a big difference. And oftentimes we obsess about things that don't necessarily make the biggest difference. That the really the most important thing is the music, like Stephen said. And that we have to really be advocates for that. And we need to hire a manager, it can be in here, who says, you know what, you need to stay on course and not be too uh, involved in an alienated technological overshadowing of your job 
which is to be a creative individual and to help others to do that too. I think on the good side, gear can be absolutely inspirational. And that's, uh, that is something that makes me very fulfilled knowing that I've made things that make people want to make music. And if I was making widgets, oh, well, I just think I'd slip my wrist. You know, it's just uh, life is too short. My goodness. My goodness. So, you know, hopefully all of you can, can take away, uh, you know, that there really is a, a purpose, that we're not uh, here because we don't want to work eight hours a week. You know, you work 16 hours a week, so you don't have to work eight hours a week because you couldn't do anything else. You'd do it for free. Um, but, you know, Amazing. we love it, <laughs> and, but we, we have to be focused on... Uh, on being true to ourselves and not being caught up in, you know, some uh, arconic forces of uh, bad technology. You know. Um, What's your feeling, Stephen? Yeah. Uh, so, so obviously, like like Peter said, I mean, I, I get the love of gear and toys. I mean, every industry is like that. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of musicians here. Uh, raise your hand if you have a guitar collection. I have three or four or five guitars. I mean, you know, everyone has their, their stuff. So if you're a guitarist, you've got a bunch of guitars. You know, back in the, in the mid 2000s, I owned 27 snare drums. I don't know if I needed 27 snare drums, but I had 27 snare drums. Now the audio engineer, his toy is the gear. That's, that's the toy of the audio engineer. And just like when you get that new Les Paul, you get that new Manly piece, you get that, you know, new Shadow Hills piece, you get that new Slate plug. I mean, that's kind of like our, our stuff. That's our stuff that we get to have as audio engineers, and I get it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you, there's, there's this, you know, fine line between sitting there trying to figure out whether, you know, this one converter versus this other converter has like this, you know, 1% difference in top end that you can hear on your really, really good barefoot monitors versus let's just get the song done because the vocal track is crap anyway through either converter, you know? <laughs> so... That's good. So again, you have to have that, that frame of reference of what you're there for. True. You know? So again, it all, it all relates back to the song. But then, you know, having said that, like I said, you know, like Peter said, the gear can be inspiring too. I mean, there's, you know, there's something about, you know, for instance, putting a big U47 in front of a singer and telling this person that this is a 55 year old mic that, you know, you know came from AR Studios and has an original, you know, tube in it and it's, you know, expensive. And it sm smells like the 60s and, you know, get a good performance out of it. And that might get, get a better performance. So the gear can be inspiring, too, just like a new Les Paul might be more inspiring than, you know, some junk you did your house out. So, you know, that's it. I agree. It's very well said. And I've had the, that exact experience of people, you know, I want to wait until I get this piece of gear or this thing or this or that or I need to have this or I need to have that. And they're crutches. And... You know, the truth of the matter is we all know the powers in the song. And though this is very important, all of us love equipment and, you know, we all understand what it is. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the song, you don't really have anything. Um, music has always been a social and emotional and spiritual commentary, right? And all we do with what we build, uh, or I should say that you build and that I use is just push out that message the best we can emotionally so that the people connect to the song. Um, do any one of you have something you'd like to say today about uh, the future of your company? Where you're going, what you're excited about? Would you like to share anything? Well, I've got the MM45. We showed that, uh, um, we debuted that at AES. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a first step to, uh, you know, people say, hey, uh, Thomas, you're, you know, your monitors are expensive, but we would try really hard actually to bring the price down as much as we possibly can. I don't, I don't want these to be these boutique things that are that only you know some son of some child in Dubai you know uh, owns. Uh, you know, we, we, and and uh, seriously, and uh, you know, and, and this you know the MM45 is the first step to take that you know the, just the, the, essentially the essence of what the speakers is and bring it down into a package that you know that's more affordable. And we're going to just keep pushing in that direction because I, you know I just like Stephen was saying you know it's sort of a democratizing thing. You know you want to. You want everybody to have those opportunities to make it, and and yeah, you know, we don't want to compromise. We don't want to uh, uh, to do anything less than than what's what we feel is right. But also, you have to you have to make things that people can afford. I could build a million dollar speaker; it would be beautiful, and I maybe I will do that someday. But um, it's fancy, but it's you know, affordable for a business. So, 
Um, you know, we, for a long time, in the, one way to design stuff and develop products is do you put somebody in a room for six months and let them just critter away there and, and come up with things and try this and blah, 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 and then here's the best thing ever, and it's going to cost way too much money, and it's going to take a long time to build, and like five people in the world will buy them. So that's one way to do things, and we've done things that way before. And um, it's a way uh, to kind of push the edge electronically design-wise, you know, and, and develop really crazy, wonderful circuits. But unfortunately, only those five people in the whole world ever learn about them. So um, it's another thing that I had to pay a guy uh, to, a lot of money to tell me, like, hey, let's figure out some products that cost what the people can afford to pay for them, and we'll sell a lot of them, and it'll make life so much easier because everything just flows from there. So um, it's not, it's not, it's not like cost-cutting engineering. That's not what we're doing. We're just being more clever with how we design the stuff to build in America, and you know, to make it pop together faster. Not nine hours of labor to put the thing together. How about one? And then the price can come down, and then we'll sell lots more of them, and be all more efficient in the whole production of everything, and uh, and be able to keep the prices down for you guys, so you can buy more, because. We're building more, and, and you get, you know, efficient in uh, what's the economic scale, like economics. So what's that called, Marita? Economy of scale. My MBA uh, <laughs> controller is here, reminding me. Um, that kind of thing. So I'm re at this point, we've done all these really exotic circuits before. Uh, we're still developing new ones, but we're doing it so that we can make these really cool products that more people can enjoy. And that's, that's what I'm focused on right now. And not out of greed, it's just we want more people to, to be inspired by this really cool Mike Free to come out with a good song, and it's cool. That's what we're doing. Stephen, can you talk a little bit about the Raven? Yeah, so um, the Raven. So the Raven's a touchscreen control surface that, uh, uh, well, well, here's the whole, mission with the Raven. Uh, over the last 25 years, you know, the industry uh, has been taking all these wonderful audio devices and putting them on a computer screen. So for instance, let's talk about like one of the main, you know, DAWs, Pro Tools. So if you look at Pro Tools, Pro Tools is your multi-track recorder, it's your mixer, it's your editor, it's your racks of gear, and you know, again, all these things that 25 years ago you'd walk into a studio, these would all be physical things, are now on a computer screen. So the theory behind the Raven is we took the computer screen and we turned it into a control service. And, and it's a really interesting way of working where it takes that, that, that stuff that used to be real and makes it controllable. So I can move faders, I can mix, I can touch the plugins you know, as if they were you know, rackier in front of you. And, uh, and it really enhances the workflow. And again, what's the whole point of all that? It's to, to take another obstacle out of the creation process so you can get to that final song easier, faster, better, and of course, more affordable since the price of like, you know, even our big Raven is 10K uh, and a big console can be somewhere around a half a million. So if you look at that, the two differences, and again, these two things can accomplish a lot of the same things. So it kind of falls in our mission of making it, you know, uh, using modern technology to help media creators do their thing. Thank you very much for all coming. And as I said, the, these four people, I promise you, if you check out what they have and make, if you don't already have it, you will not be disappointed. And of course, can we give a hand to Vintage King, who's allowed this to happen today? All right. Have a good show. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks, guys.